This one is night one of WrestleMania. Chuck. Okay. We we already did Stand and Deliver, right? That yes. Was, that was five hours ago. Yeah. Okay. And we did uh, Ring of Honor? Yes. Okay. But you still haven't seen all of them. And but... SmackDown? Yeah. I don't think I'm going to watch the rest of it. I got to watch, get... watch Collision after this show. At some point in the next week, watch the Kyle Fletcher match. Okay. okay. Well, I'll, I'll do what I can. But I got to watch Collision and Arena Mexico main event. And Yoda Suji lost to Sonata. Or not Sonata, Naito. Yeah. I'm going to be angry about spoilers. It was 24 hours ago, everybody. Don't get mad at me. But anyway, there's just there's just a lot. So let's get going. I suppose I should start at the beginning here, which is way up here. We watched WWE WrestleMania 40 Night 1. I guess they wanted to say WrestleMania Saturday, if you want to be very technical about it. April 6th, 2024. So it's a very long show. They do the Star Spangled Banner. You know what's funny is it wasn't even that long. It really wasn't. It, it was it was just over four hours. Yeah. But you know the the problem and I you know I got to give I will give them one thing. They are spending less time between matches. We still do get video packages. Until the main event. <laughs> but the video packages are better, and the video package for the main event wasn't that long. The issue was we had four guys and they were going to do their entire entrance. I saw online that from the bell ringing to end Sammy and Gunther to the bell ringing to start the main event was forty minutes. Well, it was actually 36. Okay. And I know this because we had a competition on the board. Ah, I see. Okay. And Scats won. He okay. predicted 36 minutes to get from the end of the previous match into the ring for the next match. I see. That's way too long. Yeah. And uh, and then let's cut to the chase. The Rock pin Cody. It is bloodline rules tomorrow. The main event went... I, I had it as 39 minutes. Somebody else said 44. I said 43. I'm 43. Yeah. It, may, it may have been 40. It probably was 43. But uh, it was a it was a 12-minute match. Thank you. That's the key. That they stretched out <laughs> for 44 minutes. I've seen some really great 40-minute matches. And, hey, this let me tell you this, everybody. I had the, the match lineup and also how long every match was going to be in advance. And I have the same for tomorrow. And uh, it was planned to be a 45-minute match. And, uh, and it was. And they're also giving about 40, 45 minutes for tomorrow's main event. Now, I do expect tomorrow's main event to be far more exciting because it is bloodline rules. And so this had like some smoke and mirrors, but I think that tomorrow's going to have a lot of smoke and mirrors. And I think that tomorrow is when you are going to see John Cena, Stone Cold Steve Austin, maybe even The Undertaker. Yeah. You're going to see, like, all these guys are all going to do run-ins. It's going to be like, you know, this show opened up with Triple H coming out and talking about how it's a new era. They're really pushing this renaissance thing. And I think that the end of the main event tomorrow, the story is going to be like, it's the end of an old era and the beginning of a new era. So the old era and the new era are going to clash. The new era is going to come out on top. And, uh, and that's going to be that. So I, I actually am kind of bullish on tomorrow, but we shall see. And uh, the other thing I will say, I think we should just review the main event first. Uh, Rock pinning Cody. Like, the thing with this show is every match, with the exception of I did not expect fucking R-Truth and The Miz to win the Raw Tag Team titles. <laughs> Although when you really think about it, if you have been watching Raw and you saw the storyline that they did with the Judgment Day and Truth, and how much people loved Truth, and how he got fucked over in the end, it actually makes sense that he ended the reign of the Judgment Day. But it was our truth and The Miz, and I could not bring my brain to put the tag team titles on The Miz in 2024. But like other net, every finish was exactly what you expect. I think I predicted almost everything on this show except for the Uso match, exactly. And I figured that... Rock was going to pin Cody, provided the Rock has agreed to do a singles match with Cody. And, you know, Rock didn't do a lot, but he did a match. And he didn't get hurt, and he didn't get tired, and he didn't do a lot. But, like, I think he can do a singles with Cody, and then I think he's going to do a singles match with The Rock as Roman. His, or Roman is his final match. But we may as well review this 44-minute uh, match. It should only take like two minutes because it was a 12-minute match. Yes. But it was uh, it was what it was. So it's Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins versus Roman Reigns and Rock. 16 minutes of entrances. Yeah. For, per uh, Nodi Hudakon, which would be uh, the entrances would be the second longest match in the show behind the ladder match. 
And by the way, for those wondering, the first person out was Cody, mm-hmm. followed by Seth, followed by The Rock, and then Roman Reigns was the final person introduced. Well, he is the champion. Yes. yes. So they do, I will charitably say they did some stuff in the ring. That's very generous of me. And then it was 15 straight minutes of crowd brawling. Yeah. We did a whole lot of nothing. And you know, I got to say about that, uh, this whole match, I I actually thought that was impossibly stupid what they did because this whole match was built around if if Cody and Seth win, then it is a straight match on Sunday. Yes. But if Rock and Roman win, it's bloodline rules, right? Mm -hmm. Which means anything goes. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. So this match was not bloodline rules. It was a normal wrestling match. But the referee, when they fought outside, starts counting. And The Rock immediately tells him to stop counting right now. He said, if you count, I will fire you. His exact words, and I have to scroll back like 300 pages to get to it. You know The Rock, he said, I don't fuck around. You count, you're fired. So at that point, it was like, why did we even do this match? Because now we know that even if Cody and Seth won, all The Rock has to tell the referee is, hey, fuck you, dude. You disqualify Roman or whatever, or you're fired. So I thought that was stupid. And Rock may have just done that on his own accord. But anyway, yes, they brought in the crowd for hours, yeah. and the ref did nothing. Well, before they brought into the crowd, it was very clunky. So I was happy. It was better the when they were walking and talking. Right. Especially The Rock. So they eventually get back in the ring 15 minutes later. Roman clips Seth's knee. And as the action continued to, I suppose, unfold, is the word, I was reminded of the famous Tracy Smothers quote, we're going to start off slow and then taper off from there. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened for minutes on end. The highlight of this portion may have been when Rock hit a low blow and then whipped Seth into the ropes, and Seth was running the ropes while grabbing his balls. Yes, there's the highlight. I don't know if I'd say that, but it was funny. Somewhere in here. <laughs> Are we sure you should be reviewing this particular match, Vinny? Have at it. Be my guest. Well, listen. Was it too long by a half hour? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, is that all? Well, I wouldn't say a half hour. This would have been. I would. This would have been fine at twenty. Three minutes or so. It would have been a lot better. At it did not minutes. need to be forty-four minutes long. It would have been much better at thirteen minutes. But at the end of the day, Rock has limited matches left. Everybody wanted to see the goddamn Rock. I'm sure he wanted to put in forty-five minutes. It was what they did, and you know, I I've seen plenty of matches worse than this. I have too. They, they just stretched it. The, the, the hell last out. thirteen, fifteen minutes was very good. Yeah, it just took forever to get there. And, you know, at the end of the day, they had a few things that they needed to get in. They needed to get in Mama Rhodes. They needed to get in the weight belt shot. They needed to get in the tease for the people's elbow and then later hit the people's elbow. And the biggest one of all, hey, listen, you know, this crowd was tired by the three-hour and 45-minute mark. And freezing. But, man, when Roman Reigns set up for that spear and he's going to spear Cody— and Cody is standing right in front of Roman Reigns. Yeah. Everybody in the fucking crowd knew exactly what was going to happen. And he storms across the ring, and Seth pulls Cody out of the way, and Roman Reigns speared the rock, and this fucking place went nuts. They went nuts. And you should have seen Rock selling this spear. He yes. was a king. <laughs> and then they, like, hit all these moves, and you think it's over, but there's a save. And then they brawl outside some more, and Rock took a uh, his own move, a urinage, a rock bottom through the table outside. What do you call Every- me? Everybody's dead. And uh, Cody throws Rock into the ring. Roman hits a drive-by. Cody and Roman get in this brawl. Cody hits the crossroads. He hits another crossroads. He's going for the third, and all of a sudden... Fucking strapped on the back by The Rock. He strapped the shit out of Cody. And Cody goes down. Roman spears him. Roman can now pin Cody Rhodes. But Rock makes sure, I want that fucking tag. And so Roman's like, all right, take the tag. And he tags the guy in. Rock hits the rock bottom. Does the throat slit. Does the uh, bloodline hand signal. People's elbow. One, two, three. 
And as far as, like, the story they told in the match, like, I thought the whole thing was good, just way too long. But it's not like it was a bad match. It's not like anybody looked bad, and everybody looked fine, and the people really enjoyed the end. By the end. And it sets up a lot of things. So I, I cannot say that this was, like, a failure. If anybody wants to say it's too goddamn long, the show was too goddamn long, like, go for it. That's fine. But as a match, I thought it was it was a totally fine match. It did what it needed to do. I agree with that. I uh, I thought the thing was a spectacle. I was not bored at any point. I did want them to uh, get wrap to the it point. Up. Yeah, I uh, love watching Paul Heyman, especially when uh, Roman speared The Rock. Uh, I thought Paul Heyman was going to uh, uh, expire at ringside. Um. Good match, way too long. It needed what it needed to do. Uh, you also forgot there when Roman has Cody in the guillotine and Rock grabs Cody's legs and is holding Under him down. The ring. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the the ref is looking right at it, but of course he's scared of being fired, so he can't do anything. Yes. Yeah. And Michael Cole, the voice of the promotion, says to you, the fan, "This is so stupid." <laughs> and fuck, he was right. It was stupid. Well, the Rock's using his power as a TKO yeah. board member. That's the story they're telling. Yeah, otherwise... Uh, he'll get his Like in I the say, end. the last 10, 15 minutes was pretty good. Yeah, the Speaking of stupid, what in the world was Seth Rollins wearing to the ring? Hey, he wears stupid he shit. He wears wacky shit. had a very long robe. I think, I, think, I think it was supposed to be a giant flower on his shoulder. What I, what I did like was uh, Mama Rhodes is at ringside, and she's with Cody's father-in-law, mm. who is, who is uh, Brandy's father, Sure. And apparently he's he's fighting cancer. He he's in chemo the whole nine yards. But he made it to WrestleMania, and he's standing there. He's got a weight belt over his shoulder. And uh, believe me, I'm sure that that Cody's mother is is a very classy, like legitimately a very classy lady. But the funniest thing was when they show her at ringside, and she's all mad. And and uh, I think it's Cole. One of the announcers is in the middle of saying what a classy lady Mrs. Mm -hmm. Rhodes is, and all of a sudden she just goes, bullshit! She starts screaming and swearing at The Rock. <laughs> I missed that. I was dying. It was uh, awesome. That's funny. That's I Rock. loved it. The Rock's mama was there too, but she was not mentioned. No. So we have the twin pedigrees for a double near fall. That team. was a great spot. Yeah. Place went was. nuts for that. We had, uh, towards the end there, I counted six bumps for The Rock in this match. Which is actually more than I was expecting, to be fair. Sure. And the last one was really big. I know I say all the time that table bumps are overrated, but the fact is going through a table is worse than a normal bump in the ring. And uh, that rock bottom through the table, as you know, the Uranagi by Cody, the rock through the table. And at the same time, Rock spin se pin speared Seth through the barricade. I thought that was going to set up Rock and Cody one-on-one -on -one for a while, which I guess in the end it did, and then Rock in returned and... Uh, the finish happened. So, well, the other thing too, when you get the bump through the announce table, is a normal a normal table. It just breaks right through the middle. You know exactly what's going to happen, unless it doesn't break. But like, you're going to go through the middle. It's going to go like this, and that's it. With the announce table, because of the way it's constructed, I mean, first off, you have to hope that everything's off that table and nothing mm -hmm. was left on there. And then it breaks weird. It doesn't just crack through the middle. It like kind of collapses in a weird way. So it's it's more. Um, it's more unpredictable than going through a normal table. But, hey, Rock took it. And, you know, when when I always said the Rock is never going to have another match, I said that for years. And the reason was he had two matches with John Cena, and he got pretty seriously injured in both of them. And this was a decade ago that yeah. he had those matches. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there's no way. He's 10 years older. It's just not going to happen. But as it turns out, Rock's no idiot. And uh, the big difference is, when he had those matches with Cena, he had been retired for years and years and years and years. And what he tried to do in both of them was be the old Rock. And, uh, and he couldn't, and he got hurt. In this match, there was no mistaking his understanding that he is not the old Rock. He has a few spots that he can still do, and he did them. And the rest of it was walking, talking, brawling, stomping, kicking, and cheating. And the other guy did all the work, and I thought that uh, it worked out It worked out great for him. At the end, when he's setting up for that people's elbow, do you remember when he first came back, and uh, all he did was walk to the ring, and he was totally gassed? <laughs> like, he walked to the ring, he took the mic, and he's, like, about to die. He's just... 
He did this 40-minute match, 44-minute match or whatever, and at the very end, he's standing there getting ready for the rock bottom. He ain't even breathing hard. That's how well he paced himself in this match. So uh, he can do two more, and I think he will. Do you think that Stone Cold Wrestling last year, do you think that uh, lit a fire under him? I doubt it. He's wanted to wrestle for years. It just has never worked out. Okay. I think the big difference now is when he got on that TKO board, he got $30 million, mm-hmm. which is you know more than he would make for a movie. Sure. And so I think he had no problem taking time out of his schedule mm. for that $30 million. So anyway. You want to just go backwards to the show or start at the beginning? Let's now? start at the beginning now. Okay, I'll go way, way. We might talk more about this later. Way the hell back up here. So the show went too long. They played the Star Spangled Banner. They played Triple H's music. Paul Triple H Levesque comes out. He basks in the crowd for a while. He says it's a new time and a new era, and he leaves. And I understand there's been some uh, headlines they like to put in the past. There's, there, there was a point to this, but the show was too long. This didn't need to happen. Becky Lynch versus Rhea Ripley. God bless Becky Lynch for using her WrestleMania entrance to plug her book. <laughs> yeah, that was she had, awesome. She had like her, her uh, like something from her book on her tights. Yep. Yeah. I mean, she was not fucking around here. Oh, and Rhea had a live rock concert, which is always cool. They said that Becky had a 102 degree fever all week. She was suffering from strep throat. Yep. But you know I, what? She still did a good match. They had a good opener. Yes. Yeah. When she came out, she looked uh, drawn. She looked pale. She looked very skinny. And the announcer said, oh, she's been sick. I said, well, that makes sense. Yes, yes. So it did take him a little while to get going. But the longer it went, the better it got. And uh, it was all back and forth. It was a very clean sporting contest. Nobody cheated. Nobody interfered. There was no judgment day. There was no bullshit. There's two wrestlers wrestling. And they started hitting their submission holes and other finishers, the manhandle slam, the pump handle slam, with a very cool Vinny V-style setup, I will say. And uh, they <laughs> they. St- do a spot where Becky's on Rhea's shoulders. Oh, my gosh. They tumble out the side of the floor, and she's still on Becky's shoulders. And then Becky gets an electric chair drop from there on the floor. That had to suck. And then they're fighting on the top rope. Becky goes to the avalanche manhandle slam. Rhea escapes that, hits the pump handle slam into the turnbuckle. And then one in the ring gets the win. It was a very good WrestleMania opener. I thought this was an excellent opening match. And I thought both women looked great, especially considering Becky had strep throat and a fever all week long. Yep. And uh, this was what she wanted. She wanted to work that opener. She got to do it. And, you know, I did the prediction show with Lance on Wednesday, and uh, I predicted Rhea. And as soon as she had that live band, I was like, she's got to win this match because Becky's already a star. She doesn't need to be the champion. Rhea is the hottest woman they have in the entire company. I mean, she's a star at the level of the big men stars. There's no reason to beat her right now. And on a WrestleMania show where you're going to have a lot of happy endings, you got to have some heels going over. And that's exactly what they did here. And uh, I thought it was a very good match. You know, they always have those uh, the 3D graphics that are just floating in the air. Um, the one with Becky's book actually on the stage, it got me. I thought it was <laughs> I thought it was legit for a minute. And then she walked through it? Yeah. Yes. Like, oh, hey. Well, it's, that's like the the best thing they ever done with that. It was pretty cool. Uh, quick aside before we move on, the pictures of Rock selling the spear are now being shared and laughed at by the Transformers accounts I follow on Twitter. Wow. So this is okay. It's going well. Uh, Michael Cole, I'm almost positive you actually said this. Right after this break, Six brave tag teams will compete in a ladder match. <laughs> well, and I hope I'm right. They they were brave. They were brave. It was a ladder match. I also want to say sets of belts. I want to say during the break, usually the, you know there's a commercial for the non-premium Peacock people, mm-hmm. and usually they just play a generic ad for some other program they have or a generic high, high, uh, personality video. This one was pretty deadly, in the park. Sadly, not wearing their ring gear, but uh, discussing the other teams in this tag match instead of them and who they like who they don't like insults and jokes and all this it was fun and clever and i enjoyed it they they uh, someone mentioned this on twitter and it's true the the video packages that they have are vastly improved with the new production team they're they're all different they're all unique they're they're uh you know specific to whatever's going on 
I thought they did a great job with the video packages. Do we need this many? No. I mean, you could have done this show in a lot less time, but what they did I thought was was really good. I got the uh, free version of Peacock with my uh, telephone bill. So uh, I saw a preview for the new Planet of the Apes movie. Ah. So, yeah. I've heard those movies are really good. Oh, yeah. I only saw the first one. Let me see the they're, they're very good. Six-team ladder match for two sets of tag team belts. DIY versus Awesome Truth versus New Catch Republic versus New Day versus A-Town Down Under versus Judgment Day. You know, I got to say that I watch all the shows, and in building this up, I'm surprised they did not push harder that the tag team titles could be split. Mm -hmm. Like, I did the show with Lance Wednesday. I had not even thought of it. And Lance goes, I got an interesting thing they might do. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that brought up one team grabs one set of belts and the other team, and I was like, I never thought of that. <laughs> they never push that on television. And then, like, when they're introducing all the teams, you know, you see the, the belts hanging from the ceiling, and, like, one set of belts is over here, and the other is way over here, and they're so far apart, it's, it's patently obvious what they're doing. Like, they're going to split the belts. And, you know, they still don't push it hard. They just have the ring announcer say that, you know, this match will not end until both sets of belts are taken down. Once one set is taken down, the match doesn't end until the other set. And I was like... I guess maybe if they pushed it hard, it would have been too obvious they were splitting the belts or whatever. But I don't know. It was weird. It, it was fairly obvious what the finish was going to be because they didn't have all four belts hanging from the same hook. It was, well, exactly. They were split. They were they were far apart from each other. And so I knew immediately that A-Town Down Under was winning one set. Like as soon as they lost in that just they, – they did. There was no reason for it. They just had uh, Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate versus A-Town Down on SmackDown. And two teams in a ladder match for no reason, other than they're both in a ladder match. And, uh, and Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne beat them. And as soon as that happened, I knew A-Town Downs winning. Pete Dunne and Tyler Bates are first set of challengers. So the only question was, who wins the other set? If anybody. Well, the funny thing was, because they had two sets of belts to win, this is basically two ladder matches back-to-back. -back. Yeah. And the first one was by WWE ladder match standards incredibly tame and totally anticlimactic. And the the the, the biggest spot was uh, New Catch Republic doing mirrored moonsaults off a ladder onto the floor. Otherwise, they just wrestled. Guys might get hit with a ladder or maybe thrown into a ladder as leaning in the corner, but nothing completely insane. They did a comedy spot with Truth getting a hot tag during this ladder match because he's insane, doesn't know what's going on. Crowd loved it. Uh. Everyone fights for a while. The ring is empty, and Grayson Waller, out of nowhere, scurries up a ladder and grabs the SmackDown belts. And the instant that happened, and the it, mood totally and, changed. And it took him forever to get up there oh, that too. and forever to undo. I'm just waiting for somebody to show up, yes. and no one does. And the crowd's like, oh, because they actually said the winner of this, these belts, like they played it up like the whole match was over. So I think everybody might have been a little confused. And then... The match continued. Boy, did it. Yes. And the very first thing they did was, I forget who it was, but two guys grabbed Grayson Waller and powerbombed him off the ladder, still carrying his new championship belt, powerbombed him through a ladder bridge, and he seemed very, very unhappy about that, writhing and screaming on the ground in pain, and was never oh. seen again. There was more insanity. We had Xavier Woods doing a diving elbow to Champa across the ladder bridge that did not break. We had Kofi doing a trust fall off a ladder onto a bunch of dudes on the floor. We had a wacky springboard DDT that put Pete Dunn through a table. Gargano put Pete Dunn through a table. That looked terrifying. Yes. As you, as you, you dive, the guy taking the DDT, which is done, is essentially doing a head first dive through the table like Mick Foley. Ugh. Basically, what happened. And what happened next is even nuttier because Ciampa, at the top of the ladder, grabs bait, does an air raid crash oh, off the top of the ladder. Oh, my. Good God. Lord Almighty. That was horrifying. So J.D. McDonough is in there trying to help Judgment Day win. New Day dumps him off the ladder through two tables. And you could hear them shouting, just tip it, just tip it, like they had planned something else and decided to just get it done. And Damian Priest super kicks, super kicks a chair into Woods' face. Kofi gets Razor's edge onto the chair. And Woods and Priest are fighting atop a very scary ladder. that looks like it might fall down any time. Well, what happened is there's a ladder, and they have to do a spot on it. And so Priest goes to start climbing this ladder... And referee Jessica Carr 
fucking grabs his leg. She's yeah. like grabbing his leg, like, don't climb. And he has no idea what's going on. So I think he thinks it must be one of the other wrestlers. So he's trying to yank his leg away, and he's looking back and screaming. He realizes the ref, and she's like yelling at him, like, stop. And he totally ignored her, and he started climbing. And probably about halfway up, he realized, oh, shit. <laughs> now I know what she's fucking grabbing my foot for. This ladder is fucked. Yeah. And so, you know, they both climb anyway, even though this thing is about to collapse. And they, they tried what they claimed was... Uh, I think they said it was like the broken arrow off the top or something. I forget what they said it was. Yeah, that's the claim. They both just fell down, yep. almost yeah. killed themselves. And then, you know, Priest is supposed to immediately do another spot, but the ladder's broken. So time just stopped. <laughs> this poor guy has to fold up the ladder, throw the goddamn thing outside. Truth realizes that this is a problem. So him and another referee are throwing another ladder in the ring, which they catch on, on camera. So he brings in the other, and he finally sets it up. And I'm like, oh, my God. If this is the finish, and, like, he had to set up a whole different ladder to try to get those belts. But he gets tipped over and uh, and thrown off again. And then, uh, and then Truth starts to climb. And I'm looking around, and there's, like, no one around. And he's he's getting higher. <laughs> and, like... Usually when someone is going to do something, if you'll notice, they cut in real close to the guy climbing. So you can't see the other person right. who's coming in. But when they do the long hard cam shot and they just keep it there, that's usually the finish. And I'm like, what the fuck's happening? And he keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. And then he reaches up and he starts unhooking. And I was like, is someone dead? What is supposed to be happening here? And then he got it, and he won. The bell rang. And at first, I mean, at first, honest to God, I was flabbergasted. But then I really thought back to the months of storylines that they had done with Truth and The Judgment Day. And if you remember, if you watched the shows, it started out as like just a couple-week thing because it was December. There was nothing to do until the Royal Rumble. They needed something for TV. And so they did the storyline where he thought he was part of the Judgment Day and they took him in, but he was getting so over. Like, the fans loved the guy. And so they went with it, and they kept him in there. And when it was finally time to start building all the matches for Mania, they, like, kicked him out, but he was still super over. And whatever you want to say about it, if you watch this ladder match with all of the crazy stunts and the crazy shit, the biggest pop of the match was when R-Truth stood on the apron and demanded a tag in a match yeah. where there are no tags. And everybody in the goddamn building got to their feet. And they're fucking going crazy. And so he got a actual hot tag in a goddamn ladder match. He does the John Cena comeback. And they're fucking going nuts. And so at the end of the day, great. Great. Who cares? You can beat them later. But the fans loved it. It paid off a storyline with him and the Judgment Day. He finally got his big win over Damian Priest, and uh, I was fine with it. And no one got killed, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a good match. Along with the uh, callback to John Cena's comeback, we also had uh, DIY dressed up in DX gear, and we had Consequences Creed on this show. Well, yeah, he was there in Philadelphia. They so. called him Consequences Creed, and then I remembered, oh, yeah, they're working at TNA now. Well, he had that name in many other promotions, but uh, Not yeah, this he, one. Well, he was Consequences Creed was of course dressed as Apollo Creed because he always is, but uh, Kofi was also dressed like Rocky. So there you oh, go. Oh, that's what that was. Yes, gotcha. they were in Philadelphia. Understood. Anyway, that was also fun. Rey Mysterio and Andrade versus Santos Escobar and Dominic Mysterio. So there was some very cool wrestling in this match. My favorite was when Andrade gets in the, I think it was the middle rope, and Rey stands on his shoulders. And from that position, they did double cross body to the floor. It was awesome. That may have been my favorite spot of the entire weekend, honestly. But did you really watch it? <laughs> so Ray is on his shoulders. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's sitting on it like a chicken fight. But unfortunately, that means that when they die for the double high cross, mm -hmm. well, Andrade's head is under Ray Mysterio's body. Yes. Correct. And he fucking smashed his head on the ground. Well, that part sucks. I was like... 
Did you guys try this once before nope. uh, doing this, or did I'm it sure, seem like a good idea? I'm sure they did not. He seemed fine, yeah. but uh, that was a shitty landing for poor Andrade. He made a great comeback, by the way. Oh, yeah. Like I said, there was a lot of good wrestling in this match. However, it was overshadowed by the cameos and interference from like a dozen people. Well, the thing at the end, here's how I determine if uh, if things are good or bad, okay? I take notes, okay? If I'm taking notes, and it's like the main event, and uh, in the middle of taking notes, I can, like, compose an entire email, your match is way too fucking slow. Nothing's happening. If I'm taking notes on the last three minutes of a match, and I literally cannot keep up, you're doing way too much. And at the end of this match, when they had... Electra and Zelina and Joaquin and uh, like they were all doing dives and then Jason Kelsey and Lane Johnson and Lucha Masks came out of the crowd and they start doing spots and I'm like what the fuck is happening I couldn't keep up it was way too much but uh, yes uh, two large luchadors I'm yeah. talking gigantic yes yeah interfered the attack Dominic nobody had any earthly idea what was going on well. Mm. I mean, they they were in Philadelphia, very large men, wearing Eagles-themed lucha masks. Well, I'm sure they knew they were players. Yes. But they didn't know who. Or or why, frankly. But uh, Joaquin Wilde got his WrestleMania moment. Actually said, give me my WrestleMania moment and shook the ropes. Yep. And they did this bit launching him through the sky, and he fell on dudes. He didn't even go that far. It was, the, the one in the NXT, maybe because we were inside, but it looked much farther. Well, yeah, it could also, oh, yeah, small also building. a smaller building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, these two giant masked men jump Dominic, and they throw him into the ring, and Ray 619's both heels, and splashes Santos and pins him, and they win, and the giant luchadors get up in the apron, and the slightly less gigantic one vaults into the ring, and the unmask is recently retired Jason Kelsey and Lane Johnson, uh, Super Bowl champions with the Philadelphia Eagles, and uh, I just want to point out that uh, apparently since retiring, he's retired like two months ago, uh, Kelsey's down to only... 275 pounds. Oh, that's good. But that is a big dude vaulting over the ropes like that. Well, I'll give you my football knowledge. Right. I know this because uh, Jason Kelsey's brother is dating Taylor Swift. So Correct. he got all the scoops from uh, Whitney. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this Jason Kelsey is a gigantic wrestling mark. Ah. Yeah. And uh, he is constantly talking about wrestling. He uh, just absolutely loves it. And I would not be the least bit surprised if we see Jason Kelsey at like SummerSlam Sure. Or next year's WrestleMania, like he'd die to be able to do something for WWE. So uh, there he was, and uh, I thought this match was uh, was good. I thought it was a good match. You know, they didn't have a ton of time. I guess my only—it's not really a complaint, but I've been watching Andrade, and uh, he does the same spot in every match, which Charlotte did every now and then, which is you do the moon salt, the guy rolls out of the way, and then he had the standing moon salt, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Far be it from me to uh, give advice to Andrade El Idolo, but like if it were me, I would just hit a moonsault 80% uh, of my matches. So that way, on a big show, you sure. go for the moonsault, they roll, and you hit the standing moonsault. As it is, it's like his idiot opponent always knows to roll the wrong way to get hit with the second moonsault. It's like Ric Flair going up to the top rope and getting thrown off every time. It's like... That should be something special that you do on special occasions okay. as a special family. counter. It's a family thing. As opposed to every last single match, you do the exact same spot. It's like Billy Kidman's uh, never powerbomb Billy Kidman. Yeah, right. It's yeah. like never roll out of the way of Andrade's moonsault because he's going to hit you another one. Or roll towards the corner, mm -hmm. which is what you're supposed to do anyway in real life. Right. And then his move will be foiled. <laughs> I like the match. Remember, uh, Andrade was doing the uh, the figure eight in AEW as well. Yes. He was also using Charlotte's moonsault from the top rope to the floor, which, um, man, I'd stopped that yesterday. Yeah, Brian had a long rant about that. So. Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the Kalani. way, Kalani speaking Kalani. of... Uh, right this morning, I'm sorry, earlier this it afternoon. Was, it was earlier this afternoon. Jesus. You know, yes. speaking of uh, rants, like yesterday I got really pissed off that they gave Electra that tree slam. Yeah. Well, the women start to do a spot. And Zelina goes for, like, a moonsault off the post onto Electra, And Electra is fucking miles away. Yeah. She's nowhere near where she's supposed to be. She has one spot at WrestleMania. And once again, in a spot involving Zelina and Elektra, Zelina almost gets killed. She's uh, escaped death twice. 
Hopefully we can get these two as far away from each other as humanly possible. And uh, Electra should just be a manager. Uh, I don't think you don't. Not everyone needs to wrestle. Let her be a manager. It's fine. Jimmy Uso versus Jay Uso. Well, first we had uh, Little Wayne, Lil Wayne. <laughs> I'm sorry, Little Wayne. Lil Wayne. <laughs> and I quote, "The greatest rapper of all time." That's what they called him. That's what they said. The greatest rapper. I like Little Wayne. I believe you do. Yes. When I when I become a rapper, that's what I'm going to be. Little Wayne. Yes. So he rapped Jay down to the ring. But first, they had a incredible hype video for Jimmy and Jay Uso. <laughs> Debatable, says Brandon. No shit. <laughs> like, I don't know a ton about rap, but I can tell you one thing. You don't say. Lil Wayne is not the greatest rapper of all time. He's it's just there. not. I didn't say he was horrible or anything. I said, come on. I'm tempted to quiz you, but... <laughs> so, there was a great, great video hyping up the lifelong relationship between Jonathan Salofa Fatu and Joshua Salofa Fatu. Yes. It was good. It was awesome. It was fucking awesome. And how I am my brother's keeper, but after all they've been through now, I am not my brother's keeper. And then the bell rang. Bro. Mm-hmm. Say it. Uh, well, I'll put it this way. So I knew this was going to be a 10-minute match. That's what it was scheduled to be. And I thought, Jimmy and Jay, one-on-one, -on -one, WrestleMania, 10 minutes. The, there's only one reason it can be a 10-minute match, and that is there's an angle at the end. Something's happening. Probably I predicted Jimmy beats Jay. It's the beginning of the feud, not the end. So I'm watching this fucking match, and they're working it. Like, it's a nothing-happening match to set up an angle. And then, at the end, Jay's killing him. Jimmy begs off, says he's sorry, but he hits a sucker super kick. He goes up top for the big splash. I'm like, here we go. Match is over. Let's do the angle. Jay kicks out. Jay spears him. Jay hits a big splash. Jay pins Jimmy mm -hmm. in a total nothing star and a half if you're being nice just their match and I'm like okay I okay I get it babyface wins but then the heel and it's like some new guy Tamatanga shows up they beat the shit out of him that said nothing nothing J1 he celebrated yeah and they moved on mm -hmm. i i liked at the very beginning of the match michael cole pointed out that there's been three brother matches at wrestlemania brett Nowen, the hardys and now this one i think only I, one of them I'm, was good i'm they going to should have stopped at one i'm going to clarify what michael cole said there have only been three real life brothers <laughs> okay okay <laughs> because wow. taker and kane wrestled several times wow yes okay. huh right. that's, that's an interesting thing to say yes yeah but still yeah but still yeah, uh, I know the Usos are noted for super kicks. I counted nine super kicks in this match, plus one jumping super kick. That's plus, ten then. Then That's one a super duper kick. Fair enough. Then one teased super kick, but Jay stopped because Jimmy was begging off. That's the most interesting thing I have to say about this match. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. Yeah, let's just go on. Bianca Belair and Naomi and Jade Cargill versus Damage Control. You know what's funny about this match? I wrote the review before the match finished. <laughs> like, I was cooking during this match. And so... Is this when you burned the chicken? I didn't burn the chicken. It's funny. The chicken was good. It was the oil. You burned the oil. Yeah. Yeah, we spent... Uh, I gotta I, finish. I gotta figure out this chicken thing. Like, I can cook meat great, but, you know, Br steak. Brian made me a you steak know, earlier. Your chicken is meat, right? But it's different. It's, <laughs> you, I mean, you can't have rare chicken. No. You'll die. So <laughs> You really uh, should not. Uh, Brian made me a delicious steak when I got here. Steak yeah. with caramelized onions. It's fucking great. And the, the, the chicken dish you made tasted very good. It tasted good, but it, the, I need to work on it. 20 minutes before that was... Yeah, we almost set the house on fire. And and your your fire alarms are too high for me to reach to turn them off. Yeah. The smoke alarms. So. Yeah. But anyway, I was cooking. Yeah. And so this match starts, and they and they got the heat on uh, Naomi. And I, I just sat down, and I wrote exactly what happens. Naomi makes the hot tag to uh, Bianca. Uh, Bianca makes comeback, gets cut off. They work her over. She makes odd tag to Jade. Jade kills everybody and wins. I wrote it all down. And then I kept cooking. <laughs> and uh, 
That is literally exactly what happened. <laughs> exactly. What happened. Yeah. They did exactly what they should have done, what you would expect them to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was by the numbers. It was fine. Yes. It was just there to get over Jade. Yes, exactly. Yes. I, I wrote barely anything about this until Jade tagged in. And then I just noted she did very basic stuff. She did not move a thousand miles an hour to make sure that stuff was done correctly. Everything was done correctly. She had great poise. She seemed very comfortable in this giant atmosphere, this huge event. She's a star. Mm -hmm. My favorite part is when uh, the other women return or they're doing stuff, and Asuka goes to blow mist at, I believe, Bianca, but Bianca dodges, and the mist is supposed to hit Kyrie in the face. Right. But it's very windy, so the wind just carries the mist throughout the Philadelphia skyline, <laughs> poisoning perhaps hundreds. Who knows? And Bianca does her whip spot and hits the, the kiss of death on Asuka. And Jade pins Kai with Jaded. Was this much of a match? Not really. Was it a showcase for Jade? Yes. And it was great. Yes. Not everything at WrestleMania is a giant blow-off WrestleMania moment. Yes. Sometimes you have to use WrestleMania to start new things, to get new people over, to kick things off. And that's what this match was. And it was exactly uh, what... Uh, what it was meant to be. By the way, since people are talking about it on the uh, chat, I want to make it clear. I can cook chicken in various ways. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But what happened is I got a brand new, really nice set of cast iron pans. I got a big uh, f flat one, and then I got a, a, a big one and a smaller one. And I'm trying to learn to cook everything in cast iron. And uh, I could have barbecued the chicken. I could have put the chicken in the oven. I wanted to, to I'm working on, how do I make it in this cast iron skillet here? And uh, I think the first thing is less oil. Well, I think that was the main problem. Yeah, lower temperature. Yeah. I didn't even, it wasn't even that hot. I think it was, I, but I, I just, I figured like, I don't want this chicken sticking. No, you, you know? don't. No. So I, I, I just bathed it in, uh, in uh, avocado oil. And uh, probably... Some oils have a very low smoke point. But this has a high... It's like 500 degrees oh, for avocado oil. I didn't know that. But um, it was a lot of it. Yeah. While we're uh, on tangents here, I'll point out that last year, Billboard magazine ranked Lil Wayne the seventh greatest rapper. Exactly. That's what I said. People were making fun of me. I told you he was number one. I didn't say anything bad about the guy. Who was number one? Jay-Z. Okay. Right. Okay. Now... Where yes. was Flava Flav? Let's see here. Command F. He's, a, he's more of a hype man than a rapper. He, he is mentioned, but he's not ranked. Mm. Uh, Chuck D was 34, which actually seems way sure. low. I'm no expert on the subject. But, sure. Yeah. All right. Now, Brian, as you mentioned, some matches at WrestleMania are not meant to be all-time classics. Others are. Some are. Sami Zayn versus Gunther. Sami's backstage. He gets best wishes from his family. And I can't help but note there's a lot of people on the show who talked to, talked about or were shown with their family. It's a, a common thread now. These people are real people who have real relations out in the world and who care about them. He meets with Chad Gable, who gives him a pep talk, but is very surprised when Chad tells him to go out alone. You got this on your own. You always do. And right before he goes to the curtain, there's KO. And they have a very manly hug, and KO shakes him and tells him to go out there and get it. And it's Sami Zayn versus Gunther. What a match. What a fucking match. You know the beautiful thing about this? It was so simple. Yeah. They did chops. They did elbows. Gunther did a bunch of power bombs and a drop kick. But there weren't like 14 moves in sequence or anything. There wasn't 700 counters in a row. A big, scary guy beat the tar out of a significantly smaller guy. And you wanted to see the smaller guy come back and get him. So... Eventually, after, as, as uh, I think Graves called it, got the Tyrannosaurus dropkick. Yeah. <laughs> and a power bomb for two. Gunther takes over and for the most part is just killing this guy. And Sam is getting his host swaps here and there to make, let people know he's alive. But Gunther's just slaughtering him. Close lines, multiple power bombs. And uh, he begins to, he's getting overconfident. Gunther made a mistake. Easy to get overconfident when you were the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. He begins to taunt Mrs. Zane in the front row. Mock her, this is your husband, and he gets frustrated because Sammy is still kicking out of everything. But he's in complete control. And if he hits a drop kick like a Tyrannosaurus, as we as we have mentioned before, 
He does a top rope splash like a truck driving off a cliff. Just no grace or style to it whatsoever, but it looks like it hurts real bad. He does a couple of those, but now he's not even trying to cover. He's laughing. Ha ha, this silly Canadian thing he could beat a mighty Austrian man. He begins to taunt the missus some more. Sammy, without even getting to his feet, begins to fire up from the mat. He's on his back and suddenly kicking and screaming and shouting like a baby. And he can't get up, but God damn, he's alive. And Gunther gets a look in his face like, oh, fuck, I better kill this guy while I can. And he starts to climb to the top rope. But when he gets up there, Sammy springs up and runs and hits the mafia kick. And he grabs Gunther's head. Bro, this whole crowd, as soon as he climbed to that middle rope and grabbed that guy's head, the fucking crowd went, <gasps> they gasped. Like, you could mm -hmm. hear them gasp. They did not think, oh, he must be going for a superplex. This crowd was a crowd that had been here since the days of El Generico. Mm -hmm. They knew what he was about to do. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And it actually happened. I, I think he, I believe he has teased it a couple times in the past. But he's never done he it. He has never hit it in his entire oh. WWE run, which oh. is like Kevin Owens. He was in NXT before Owens was. So it's been a decade, essentially. And he lifted him up and dropped him across the turnbuckle in a brain buster. And place goes nuts. And he's still not quite dead. And he whips Gunther across the ring, runs at him, boots him in the face, runs back to the corner, runs at him, boots him in the face. Gunther's life bar has run out. Gunther collapses. Sammy's life bar is at one. He collapses on top of Gunther. And the referee counts three. Many years ago, there was a masked independent wrestler called El Generico. And as you recall, his gimmick was that he had the best match in every show. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he retired. He passed that gimmick on to Sami Zayn. And the gimmick still lives. This ruled! May 19, 2012. West Side Extreme Wrestling. El Generico versus Valter. Huh. 12 years later. We actually got El Generico versus Valter here. We did. That's what this was. Did you say where that was? Uh, I'm not actually sure where it was. That's fine. It's not a big deal. Um, but anyway, it was... Um, that's they, they did that match, and now they did it here. Big Van Walter. That's uh, right. Yeah, Big Van Walter. <laughs> um, Deutschland. That's Germany. Yeah. But uh, I'm just reading the thing here. You don't have to yell at me. But anyway. I'm trying to help you. They had a uh, uh, fucking amazing Oberhausen. match. Oberhausen. Yes. This was the best match on the show. Attendance 348. And it was funny because uh, I was watching SmackDown, and the best thing on SmackDown by Miles, was uh, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal coming down to Bronson Reed and Ivar. And they fucking were so awesome. And uh, and when it was over, and it was actually the same thing on uh, on Monday. I think it was Ivar and uh, Ricochet, the Raw match. It was like, in both of those cases, I just watched those matches and I was like, this is their WrestleMania. Hmm. And I watched this match... And at first, I thought to myself, this was Sammy's... Re Wait a second. He's it actually was his WrestleMania. And he's had Legit. several. <laughs> it's fucking great. <laughs> yep, this was this was that big moment. He got it here at WrestleMania. Beat Gunther, was champion for, ironically, 666 Perfect. hellish days. I saw that Sammy has now ended the longest NXT championship reign of all time, the longest tag team championship reign of all time, and now the longest IC reign of all time. I, oh. I did have uh, a friend there in WWE who, he didn't have any inside information, but he thought that uh, Sammy was going to shave his face, cut his hair, put on that fucking cap, mm. and come out here and, and do it. But he didn't. He was uh, the current Sammy Zayn. But goddamn, this was awesome. It was a fantastic match. Uh, Gunther, who's really hard to hate. But Impossible. Managed, <laughs> it's, he's really hard to hate. He's That's, my favorite wrestler right. in WWE, at least. But he would be killing Sammy, and then he would go over and taunt Mrs. Sammy. Yeah. And then he would go back, and he would kill Sammy some more, and then he'd run back to the, the side she was on and, and, and taunt Mrs. Sammy again. And then finally she'd had enough. She screams F you as loud as 
that the camera caught it and and then and then Sammy made his comeback. But uh, man, this match was great. There is definitely uh, been a uh, certain. There's been a definite shift in what you're allowed to say, not like in interviews, but like on camera. Mm-hmm. You know, not into the mic. I mean, there were so many fuck yous and you know, asshole, all this stuff. People yelling all sorts of shit on this show. Yeah. But um, then, of course, we had the main event. I talked about it earlier. Yeah. I'm I'm actually really happy now that we did the main event first because we get to end with yeah. Gunther and Sammy. Yeah. We end with the best match. That's and I awesome. I think if you give it a couple days, you realize the main event was was not bad. It's just long. Yeah. I would you know, if if I must give a star rating, I would go somewhere around three. Yeah, it was. But a, it was zero for a long time. It was a good match. It just was way too long. And, you know, like I said, tomorrow is also, they scheduled it for 40 minutes. But I think the big difference is going to be, I think that, that Cody and Roman can do a lot more early. You know, they can actually do stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I think all the crazy shit's going to happen. You're going to get all the cameos. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that based on the people that have been teased for this show, like I can't tell you for sure that like, John Cena and Stone Cold Steve Austin, and The Undertaker. I can't tell you that for sure, but I mean, they got something planned for tomorrow, and uh, I hope it's going to be. Uh, I hope it sends those fans home happy. Um, do you think Roman's nose is broken? Nah, I'm sure he's fine. No, you don't think so? A tough guy. It was, okay, it was bleeding, but he didn't look like misshapen or anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, everybody, we're going to wrap this one up. And man, we were up here uh, five hours ago. I was exhausted. I was sick of wrestling. I was asking myself, the f- Maybe I shouldn't swear. Maybe some kids listening today. But you know what? I'm all fired up now because we just watched the second night of WrestleMania. And holy smokes, what a show that was. Mm-hmm. And we got a very special show here today because, uh, you know, we say sometimes other people. And in fact, we are joined today by my main man, Eddie, who did a uh, Whale Scout auction. And he won, and months ago, he chose night two of WrestleMania to co-host his show. And uh, Eddie, what a night you picked, brother. Let me tell you. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Obviously, I paid the most, 1300 because I knew Cody was going to finish the story, but that's pretty much it. So did you know, were you sure Cody was going to finish the story? Because it seems to me like even today, there were a lot of people that were like, I don't know, brother. I don't know if he's going to finish that story. Uh, I was kind of nervous seeing, uh, I believe there was only two title changes in this whole two nights, so I was kind of worried at the end, but in Cody's entrance, you could tell he was emotional looking up at the sky, so kind of gave it away there that he was winning. Yeah, well, listen, we're going to talk about the whole show, and this is how it normally works with guests. Uh, We're going to get going, and Vinny and I will do a review, then we'll get your thoughts, and uh, we'll make sure at the end we, we talk to you a little bit more, get some plugs and everything like that, but... I think we're all excited to talk about WrestleMania. And so I think we should just start with my overall thoughts on the show, which I'm sure may be controversial. But I'm going to say this. If you consider what WrestleMania is supposed to be, and that is the biggest show of the year with big matches and, you know, happy endings and angles to set up future events and superstars and pomp and circumstance the whole nine yards. I think this WrestleMania, night two, might have been the greatest night of WrestleMania there's ever been. Wow. I do. I think so. Because I sat through night one, and I thought night one was, you know, it was a, it was a fine show. It was a thumbs-up show. But I think we all agreed. It's too damn long. It didn't need to go as long as it did. The main event, you know, I thought the match was better than you did, Vinny, but it still did not need to go that long. And I was tired when it was over. And, you know, I knew that night two would have, you know, Cody most likely winning. I was pretty much sure he was winning. But, you know, night two was, like, different. They, it was it was fewer matches. It was, for the most part, boom, 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 boom. Quick video package, get in the ring. Much less downtime. There was no match, I felt, that went too long. We had a few great matches. We had a cash-in that the place went wild for. 
And uh, I will explain here for all of the numbskulls on my Twitter that cannot figure out what's going on. It seems like ridiculously obvious. It had the happy ending at the end with Cody winning. It had the cameos from the big stars. If you look at the crowd on night one, I mean, it was a tough crowd. The weather probably had something to do with it. The crowd was great on night two. It was very, very clever booking. There was nothing that you thought, well, that was the stupidest thing I've ever seen, which we've seen at many, many WrestleManias at some point or another. That's true. So I, I thought that as a as a single night package, it was not too long. Like, I just thought it was great. I thought it was a fantastic night of WrestleMania. On the whole, yes. I, I think the best match of the weekend was still Sami Zayn versus Gunther. Sure. But uh, the the uh, everyone left night two feeling happy. Everyone left night one feeling a little burned out. And yeah. I, I don't think that you're only one who is more energetic now than they were 24 hours ago. Oh, for sure. And uh, how would you how would you rank this, Eddie? Best WrestleManias you've ever seen? Uh, this is probably up there because obviously um, I was a kid. Well, kind of a kid. Uh, my favorite WrestleMania was WrestleMania 20. Unfortunately, uh, because of Eddie Guerrero, he was my favorite wrestler of all time, yeah. from, in my opinion. And then obviously that moment with Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero, but this ranks up there. So night two, the crowd was pretty fired up, and it made it more impactful each match, like Bailey's match. That if I felt like probably the crowd would have gotten exhausted, but nope, they were fired up, and then they were fired up for their main event. I was just surprised Stone Cold didn't even show up, especially with the hints Triple H did today. I was honestly expecting even more run-ins than I did too. we got. Yeah. I thought we were going to have uh, Foley. debuting Samoans. I yeah, thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. thought we would have uh, you know Stone Cold coming out to make an appearance. I, I thought there would be – and you know what? It might have been overkill. I, I thought that they, they had just enough to not make it all about those appearances. I mean, I, I'd have to go and find out exactly how long the match was. But, I mean, the first 75% was a one-on-one -on -one match, which was very good. Then we had all the cameos, and the place went absolutely wild. And then they got rid of everybody and did some spots with, with Cody and Roman. And Cody got the win. And it was not the result – of anybody else. It's not like Cody won because of True. The Undertaker. True. Literally, what happened, the way they booked the match was, every time Cody was about to win, a heel would run in, and then a babyface would take care of that heel. Cody would be about to win, a heel would run in, and a babyface would show up to take out that heel. And once everybody was gone, Roman tried to win again, Cody thwarted him, Cody was the winner. Cody won this on his own. So it was very, very well booked. And, uh, and we will get to that. But you know what? Let's start at the beginning tonight. Interesting change. Of because place. we're going to end on a happy note. That's, that's, actually, that's true. Last, <laughs> last night, we started with the main event, and we ended on a happy note of Sami Zayn and Gunther. Tonight, we can start at the beginning and uh, end up here with a happy note. So here we go. We watched WWE WrestleMania 40, night 2, April 7th, 2024. It opens with Stephanie McMahon coming out to a new metal remix of her song. Yeah. I was not expecting to see her. No, it was a surprise. It was a surprise. She was at the Hall of Fame, yeah. but, you know, a lot of people show up at the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Like Keith Lee was there. He didn't show up today. No, no, he did not. Uh, she just merely notes she's very proud of the first WrestleMania of the Paul Levesque era. Mm -hmm. And nobody understands WrestleMania better than Triple H. And she left. And this is basically the same thing Hunter said to open the show last night. And I've seen Stephanie and Hunter declare new eras many, many, many times. And by the end of uh, this two-night show, I think it's the first time where I actually believe them. Yeah, but you know what's different? I'll tell you what's different. That I believe them. That's different. Well, here's why. Because every other time they've told you it's a new era, it's because things were complete shit. Yes. And so they thought if we come out here and we make some minor change and tell you it's a new era, yeah. you will believe it because you're a moron. What's happened here is they've spent 18 months creating a new era— and tonight, the big payoff for the uh, last 18 months of booking, two years, is to now declare that it is a new era after it has already been a new era. That's the difference. I mean, how many times, you know, Corbin, you know, they did that shit with Corbin and, you know, this is going to be new, that's going to be new, whatever. This is, they made it a new era first, and then they declared it at a pinnacle point of that new era. Which, if they're lucky, this ain't the pinnacle, by the way. Indeed, indeed. Yes. 
Our opener, Drew McIntyre versus Seth Rollins for the World Heavyweight title. This show just started, and uh, Pat McAfee was terrible. This was not his best show. He had a bad night all night, but it started, it was worse. He was worse at the beginning and got moderately less bad throughout the show. And I don't know this for sure, but uh, about an hour into the show, Snoop Dogg came out. And Pat implied that he and Snoop had been uh, hanging out early in, earlier in the day. Perhaps there's a connection between that and Pat's terrible performance. Oh, we will, we will get to Snoop. But they got bagpipers out there for uh, Drew. McAfee won't shut up. He's talking over the pipe music. Him and Punk. Well, he, he started it. And, and Punk at least had a point because it's Drew McIntyre's pipers. They're playing Scotland the Brave, which was Roddy Piper's song which is Punk's hero, and now it's his enemies playing it. So Punk says, this is sacrilege. But that word is too big for Pat McAfee, so McAfee is rambling on more. Cole is frantically, desperately, and Cole's a great night, but he's desperately trying to get them to shut up without saying, shut up! Like, I will say that's another one, you know, as far as, like, greatest WrestleMania I've ever seen. I'll, you know who's not a fan of Michael Cole? Me. I've often not been a fan of Cole myself. This was his greatest one-night performance of all time. He was fucking great. He was tonight what they try to tell you he has been for the last two decades. That's actually true. He was awesome. But anyway, then they have the uh, Philadelphia String Band Association playing Seth to the ring. Yes. And he comes out in this outfit. And the first thing that CM Punk says is, look at this goof. Yeah. And, (laughs) you know, I'm, I don't know, man. There's a lot that I don't have in common with CM Punk. But uh, there's there's definitely you see eye to eye here and there. We do see eye and eye in ways uh, more ways than I think that he would like. But uh, definitely not always. But uh, we were on the same page here. Look at this fucking goof. So with that out of the way, I will cut to the end. Drew McIntyre pinned Seth with a claymore to win the World Finish Spamming Championship. But let's talk about this match. This match was great. It was great, but my God, did they do a lot of finishes? Well, it was interesting because uh, the first move was a claymore. Yes. The last move was a claymore. There were at least three others in between. Yeah. And then all they did in between was pedigrees and curb stomps and future shocks and table bumps. You know, I, I had the uh, match lineups. And uh, in addition to the match lineups, as we talked about yesterday, I also had the length of time for all of the matches. And uh, it was all pretty much exactly uh, the amount of time that they'd been given. And for this one here, they, uh, they like it said, you know, Seth Rollins, Drew McIntyre, 30 minutes. So when the first move was a claymore, I was like, did Seth get hurt last night? Or like, what's going on? Seth kicks out. Then, you know, within like three minutes, they're just going near fall, near fall, big move, big move. I'm like, are they doing 30 fucking minutes of this? Like, what's going on? So uh, they end up going back and forth, hitting all their moves, the whole shebang. And uh, Drew mocks Punk outside. He says he's going to hit a GTS. Seth avoids it. But Drew hits the Claymore, fight outside. Uh, Seth gave him a stomp on the announce table, throws him into the ring. And as Seth gets in the ring, Drew hits another Claymore out of nowhere, hits another one, and pins Seth clean in the middle. Ten minutes. And I was like, man, I hope Seth's okay, because that's way shorter than they were supposed to get. And then I found out why. They had a long post-match. And it was Drew falling to his knees... He's in tears. He has been waiting four years to get his world title win at a WrestleMania that actually has people at it. And he gets on his knees and he says, give me that belt. And he makes the ref very slowly put the belt in his hands and he touches it in front of all these people. He's he's in tears. He's so happy after four years, he finally got his win. And he starts, he starts mocking CM Punk. And then he goes over to his wife and he gives her the belt. She's been with him this entire time. And then he goes back to Punk again. And he puts the belt on the table between him and Punk. And he gets on his knees on the table. And he's cutting this promo on CM Punk. And Punk's like, do you really want to do this? Like, your wife's here. Like, just be happy you won the belt. Just, like, leave me alone. And uh, Drew says... I want a picture of this moment right now to hang on my wall. He was supposed to have someone take a picture of him sitting in front of Punk with his belt. Because actually, you know, in real life, 
this was supposed to be Punk's match with Seth. Mm -hmm. It was Punk and Seth at Mania, and Punk got hurt. And so after Punk got hurt, Drew got the match. And now Drew won the title and got his moment, and he wants to rub it in a, uh, Punk's face. So he stands up, and he's holding the belt up on top of this table. And Punk stands up, and he yanks Drew's foot out. And Drew crashes on the announce table. And then Punk takes off this big metal arm brace, and he starts beating the shit out of Drew with this brace. And suddenly they hit Damian Priest's music. I thought, oh, my God. Because I thought for sure Drew was losing, but everyone kept asking, you think Priest is going to cash in? And I argued against it. I said, I don't think so. I, I don't think he's going to do it here today. So he runs down to the ring, and they ring the bell. He, uh, he destroys uh, Drew with a briefcase shot. He throws him in the ring. He hits south of heaven. He pins Drew McIntyre, and he wins the title. This fucking place went ape shit. And this guy leaves. He's got his title. He goes up and he celebrates with the uh, the Judgment Day. Drew's in the ring, just despondent and shaking his head. Tell everybody about his tweets. So shortly, very shortly before going through the curtain, Drew McIntyre took to Twitter to say, I believe, bored at work, LOL. And then just like an hour ago, he re re he quoted that tweet simply saying, fuck. Yeah. And, you know, this was one of those things where I did not expect it at all. But as soon as it happened, it was like like a light bulb just totally went off in my head. And uh, I think it's like so patently obvious what's going on. Drew McIntyre is going to get his rematch against Damian Priest at the next Clash at the Castle. He's going to win the title... So, number one, he got his title win at WrestleMania taken away from him. And then at the last clash of the castle, he ended up having to lose to Roman Reigns. So I think this is going to be his big win at Clash of the Castle. He's going to get the title, and he's going to hold it until WrestleMania, where he's going to lose to CM Punk. I think it couldn't be more obvious the way they're going. And so when it happened, I was like, well, there you go. And I also think I know exactly who's screwing Damian Priest at that show, but I'll save that for later. Oh, I can guess. Yeah. I know. Who do you think it is, Eddie? Ben Baller. You think it's be? I don't think so. Vinny? Mm -hmm. I was going to summon the Judgment Day. Really? Mommy? Dominic? I think it's going to be Bad Bunny. Aha! Uh -huh. oh. That's what I think. Interesting. But we'll see. We'll see. But anyway, Eddie, let's get your thoughts. What do you think of this opener? Uh, it was actually a great opener. Obviously, you'd notice in the main event, uh, two minutes within the match, Drew McIntyre hit a Glasgow kiss, and uh, it got Seth right in the eye. That's why he had a black and blue in the main event, and he was like... That's right, yeah, when he was slow. leaving. He had, when he was leaving in the opener, he had a giant uh, left eye bruise. What was that from, you mm -hmm. said? The Glasgow kiss. He had oh, is that what it was? Head so it got him right in the eye. That sucks. So, yeah. Yeah, for uh, my notes, I said Steph looked like a rosebud in the beginning of the match. Kind of hilarious. And I don't know if you guys, uh, I probably Vinny, because he was on Twitter earlier. Uh, CM Punk, WrestleMania was in trending number one. Somehow, Bisexual Undertaker was. Yes, I did catch that. One. That is what the casual fans have apparently named Damian Priest. They have no idea who he is. Yes. And so that's the uh, that was trending on Twitter, one of the top trends in the world. Mm -hmm. Bisexual Undertaker. I saw that and I thought, well, that would certainly be news. Oh, they're talking about Damian Priest. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, that makes more sense. Yep. Yes. Uh, A great match. It was a great match, and uh, the post match was also great. Drew is. Weeping. He, for a moment, he's, I, I think Drew Galloway's, or whatever his real name is, he's just weeping. He got his belt in front of a big, giant crowd. Seth is also weeping, and apparently, if you read his list very well, he points at Drew and shouts, you deserve it. So well, Seth, you know, the guy did deserve it. He, I mean, I, I hate that term most of the time. Well, this like, time is true. That guy literally had his moment. Yes. You, you know who Drew McIntyre is? He's producer Rob. Because Okay, produce, this I must hear. Okay, I'll tell you exactly why. Because on the literally the same exact weekend that Drew McIntyre was supposed to uh, win the title at WrestleMania, Rob was going to get his brown belt. And Rob had been training forever. He got his purple belt. He came to our gym. And I swear to God, 10 minutes the first day he was there, he absolutely destroyed his knee. Mm. He, he did something wrong. He destroyed his knee. Took nine months. He finally came back as soon as he was ready. He trained his ass off. That was going to be his day. 
And three days before it was supposed to happen, the gym shut down for COVID. And it was the same thing with Drew McIntyre. He worked his ass off. He deserved that. And it all was taken away from him. And even in the pandemic era, it is true. That guy was out there busting his ass as champion, yep. doing everything he could to keep this thing afloat in front of nobody. And so I don't like the term, you know, you deserve it. But he earned that shot in front of those fans. You know, win or lose, he earned that WrestleMania shot. And, uh, and it was taken away from him for something that was absolutely not his fault. And uh, I was very happy to see him get this moment. And he may get another one, Clash of the Castle. Uh, what is that? June? It's coming up in a few months. Yeah. yeah. June also, 25th. when Drew Please. tweeted uh, bored at work, yeah. Bad Bunny did quote tweet him and say, hope you had a good shift. Ooh. <laughs> Missed that part. Yeah. He's coming back at some point. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Why wouldn't he? A six-man Philadelphia street fight. Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits versus Karrion Cross, the Authors of Pain. Snoop Dogg is sent out to do commentary. I know it's 2024 and things have changed, but it's still very, very weird to me to hear people on a very large broadcast or telecast, whatever you want to call this, a lot of people listening, and they're just openly talking about all the weed they smoke. The world's changed since I was a young man. You know, it's funny. Is this, uh, this match, we talked about it, talked about the build, talked about how it's impossible to care, talked about how it's just a series of things that happen, and they found a way to make this exciting. And the way was... Snoop. <laughs> this guy, man, you know, you guys talk about Booker T on, on uh, NXT and how that guy's out of his mind. Yeah. Booker T was watching this just going, this guy needs to fucking calm down. <laughs> Snoop was out of his mind. But he was awesome. If they did a thing where, like, every time we do any sort of mid-card street fight, Snoop's going to do commentary, yeah. I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Just let that guy out. He's out of his mind. He knows just enough to be, like, an entertaining commentator. Like, he remembers shit from back in the day, old school stuff. And, uh, yeah, this was... He saved this match. It was just great. Within 30 seconds, I believe, he had referenced hood fights <laughs> and picnic tables. Whooping sticks. And Yogi Bear. Yeah. Because he is... got a table. He's a 57-year-old man. Yes. So... First guest was Snoop. Second guest, surprise special guest referee, Bubba Ray Dudley. Yeah. I am subtracting one star from this match's rating because they did not use the saliva version of the Dudley song. Very poor choice. Very poor choice. So the match is some fun crap. They honestly should have had, speaking of ECW Philadelphia, they should have had Natural Born Killers play in the background because it was essentially... That would have been awesome. It was essentially a tame version of a New Jack match. Yes. It was... There was uh, less profanity and sexual references and drug references, but they were just walking around smashing each other with shit for the most part. My favorite moment, I think, was when uh, B-Fab made the save after a pin attempt, and Scarlet, who looked excellent this evening, Scarlet gets in the ring, holds a trash can over her head, and charges bah! as fast as she can and hit her with it. <laughs> I laughed my ass off. The Office of Pain tried to super collider, Lastly, stepped between like Samson and broke it up. Bodies are just flying everywhere. Eventually, Karrion Cross gets in Bubba Ray's face. And Bubba reply, uh, responds by reaching in his pocket and putting on the Dudley glasses. He then became the worst referee of all time. Yeah, you know, I tweeted, uh, I don't want to ever hear Bubba talk about bias again. And it was like a total joke Whoosh. because... This fucking referee decided to totally side with the baby faces. I mean, he was 100% a biased referee. And man, these fuckers on Twitter talk about not being able to take a joke. Fuck, they were so mad, I had to tell them to fuck off. And I never even bothered to do that on Twitter. But like, and there's still people tweeting about it right now that just don't get it. And they're like, well, what about that picture of you and Dave and the AW? We did a Q&A on Jericho's fucking boat, dude. It wasn't an AW show. And even if it was, who gives a shit? We did a Q&A. Like, if a guy wants to do a refereeing gig for WWE, I don't care. He's a, he's a, he's a, what do you, what do you want to even call him? A columnist? What would be the word on, on Busted Open? He's got a show. Is that a podcast or radio well, show? I mean, he's, he's what? He's an analyst? So who cares? I had filthy fucking Tom on our show. He's a, he's wrestles all, he's in New Japan. He wrestles all over the place. Who gives a shit? 
But anyway, people got really, really, really upset about that. I must correct something I said earlier, and this is important if I want to interrupt this match. Drew did not text bored at work before he came out. He took his wife's phone and sent her a tweet while beating Seth's ass. I saw this. The announcer said he was doing a selfie. I thought he was taking a picture of Drew for a fan. I realized that was his wife. But no, apparently that is the moment when that tweet went out. That is amazing. A king, this Drew McIntyre is. Oh, he is. He's the greatest. He's phenomenal. Just phenomenal. Back to the street fight. So Bubba puts the uh, glasses on. They beat up, carrying across. Bubba's calling spots for them, participating in the what's up drop, ordering them to get tables. Like I say, a rotten referee, truly rotten. And they put him on a table. It breaks on its own. They get another one. Montez jumps very high, puts him through it. Lashley wins. This was silly. Yeah, it's fine. It was fine. I thought, silly is not bad. No, nah, it, it was three and three quarters, or two and three quarter three and I gave quarter. it for those yeah, of you yeah. that care about stars. It was, you know, whatever. But Snoop made it like five stars. So I got to give that guy credit. Eddie, what did you think of this, uh, whatever you would call it? I thought it was a glorious train wreck, in my opinion. And my, was. Every time Snoop was talking, uh, I was just thinking him and Titus O'Neil in commentary would be golden. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, one scary spot, Montez Ford, like, leaped over the uh, rope, and he literally almost landed in the fans. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You forgot about the botched table spot at the end. I was, like, kind of scared that Carrado was going to turn in that uh, when they put Karrion Cross and the table just flattened. But it was amazing. Uh, it was more than what I expected. It was fun. You know, that get the table spot that Dudley did, that was probably the loudest pop other than the main event uh, win of the night. Because everybody in unison said, get the tables. Kayla, they, oh. They had some fucking light. Oh, this, yeah, mm-hmm. it, start, it started Damn here. It. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've actually been Styles there. Match, the AJ Styles and LA Knight. Yeah, uh, it, the well, there, there was a turn the light off chant here, and then the fans got mad later. They actually cheered because they did turn it off at some point here. But, you know, I've been to, I've been to shows where they have that light, and you can't see a fucking thing. And I've been there when the fans are chanting, turn the light off. And, I mean... You know, when you have that many lights, you know, someone's going to have a light in their eyes at some point. But I don't know. Kayla asks Paul Heyman, what are bloodline rules? This was stupid. Well, we literally had a bloodline rules match on Raw this past Monday. Okay. I guess maybe they had new viewers or whatever, yeah. but. No DQ. Silly. No count out. One fall to declare to finish. Now, this is interesting because he said one man will leave his champion. The other would go home to his wife, Brandy. Yes. So, spoiler, everyone. Does Rowan get Brandy now? Because that is a fine <laughs> consolation prize. No, stop. I have people, uh, people online saying, you know, Roman, they, they, they had the gif of Kevin Ashley in the finger book of doom, and this is what Roman should do. I want to make it clear, by the way, that uh, I know someone's going to do the bullshit about how, you know, Brian, you complain when AEW doesn't tell the... Ro- Listen, I don't care if they explain bloodline rules on WrestleMania. But to have one of your commentators ask the question, what are the bloodline rules? This makes the commentator look like a fucking moron because they had bloodline rules on Monday. Paul should have just came on and said, for those of you that don't know what bloodline rules are, allow me to explain. Fine. But you don't need one of the commentators asking what the rules are when the match was on Monday. That's the issue. AJ Styles versus Elia Knight. They had a strange hype video for this. Where a guy is watching LA on his laptop, and LA steps through the window of the video player to, to make fun of the guy and bury him from being sl- slobby geek. This is a, an LA Knight fan who took the time to look up LA on his computer. At least chewing him out. Uh, I saw a tweet online. Garrett Kidney, who I believe hosts a TNA podcast. AJ Styles versus Eli Drake with Rudy Charles as referee is the most TNA match in WrestleMania history. And I believe he's right. I believe he's right. This was a pretty dang good match, actually. AJ comes out, and I can't help but know there's a lot of really big 40 and 50 year olds in wrestling these days. They had a very good match. It was pretty even until AJ countered a superplex into a suplex of his own and a face buster. They have another top rope battle. L.A. gets his flipping superplex for two. Here is where we get the crowd singing and chanting, oh, please turn the light off. Fuck these lights. We can't see. L.A. pulls out the pads on the floor, but gets backdropped onto them like Hogan and Andre. AJ tries for a count-out win. Doesn't get it. 
McAfee is making, or uh, LA is making his comeback. McAfee dubs him the Yeah God, a nickname that never needs to be repeated. They attempt many finishers, but never ever hit them until Knight gets the blunt force trauma and immediately wins. So it was the opposite of the opener. Well, you know, I like that. I mean, you don't want every single match to just be kicking out of finishes. So I like that they avoided it until the end. I thought this was a, a good match. I thought that they both worked hard. I thought it was good work. And, uh, you know, nothing nothing really to write home about. But, you know, a, a, f- a perfectly solid WrestleMania match with a babyface win. What did you think, Eddie? I thought it was a good match. AJ Styles made LA Knight look like a million bucks because LA Knight's matches is kind of boring. And, but this, this AJ was... Styles is just phenomenal. And uh, that... German, the superplex German looks scary, but AJ sold it like a king. Well, it was funny in the beginning, LA Knight gave the Slim Jim car keys to some random female who didn't even care. I don't know how she's going to get the car since the car was parked near the wrestler's parking lot, but that's another story. But yeah, it was a great match. Uh, the crowd was into it. Um, I just want to see AJ Styles versus Gunther after this match. Because well. if he did this with LA Knight, with Gunther or CM Punk or Drew... It's going to be amazing. I got to say that it is funny that uh, they mentioned both these guys that had worked in many promotions previously. And uh, obviously one of those was TNA. And if you remember both of these men in TNA, when AJ started in TNA, he was a tiny X Division guy. And uh, LA Knight was known as like a body guy. And now here we are. AJ is just shy of his 47th birthday. He was significantly larger than L.A. Knight. Yes. He is huge. Ever since he came back from injury, he is huge. Absolutely gigantic. And uh, he can still somehow do all of his stuff. I don't know how, but he does. He is, in fact, phenomenal. The Hall of Fame video and presentation of the new enshrinees. Uh, the highlights were the U.S. Express unzipping their jackets to reveal Bray Wyatt t-shirts. And Bolacano showing off her nunchaku. Yes. And we got the return of the original ECW theme song, which... The best music in wrestling history. Great, great joy. Period. We need to hear that song more. Yes. Now, before we move on to this next match, I want to share something else that's online. Albert Brill, uh, excuse me, Albert Breer, a football reporter, NFL reporter, he just mentioned, I turned on WrestleMania, and this is all so weird. Hard to tell who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, and exactly how many championship belts are there now. Well, first off, you should watch the other show. And uh, and yeah. second off, you can't figure out who the baby faces and heels are on this show. Well, that brings us to this next match, which is pretty much when he tweeted this. Logan Paul versus Kevin Owens versus Randy Orton. Did if you can't watch, watch the entrances. Clearly, clearly, he had not watched Logan Paul. I guess. Because this guy's the most natural heel in the world. No one could possibly cheer for him. Now, that being said... Part of the problem is the way this match was structured, it was, in fact, the defiant heel overcoming the odds against the cowardly baby faces who were fighting him two on one and well, could not get along. Kind of. I mean, at the beginning, they were double teaming him, but it was like two minutes before Randy decided, I'm going to fucking RKO this Kevin Owens. And Kevin caught him, and Randy backed off, and Randy just goes, yeah. covers his mouth, and the fans fucking laughed. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it was so funny. Kevin goes, are we going to do this shit now or what? Kevin and was... And Randy goes, all right, let's do it. They start fighting, and then it was on. And they, they started fighting. Kevin looked disappointed but not surprised. There's yeah. also a great moment where uh, first Logan comes out in a fucking prime truck, yeah. and he's got a fucking cannon on it, and he starts shooting up the WrestleMania sign. It's like shooting fake bullets at this sign, and the sign's blowing up and shit. And he's got a prime can that dances to the ring. Which was a dead giveaway. And then, so Kevin comes out, and Kevin gets on a golf cart. And uh, he's getting ready to head to the ring, and they hit Randy Orton's music. And so Kevin waits, and Randy starts coming out, and Kevin kind of sits there in the golf cart, and he looks at him, and he goes, get in! And Randy kind of thinks about it for a while, and then he gets on the back of the golf cart, and uh, Kevin floors it. Oh, yeah. And this thing starts fucking flying down the ramp. And... Randy Orton on the back, he, he literally is looking over Kevin. He's going, slow down, like slow. He's going to fall off and get killed. And uh, thankfully, they made it down there without dying. 
But uh, Randy saw his life flash before his eyes as he was being wheeled to the uh, ring in this golf cart. This was not the golf cart on the way to WrestleMania three with Andre the Giant. No, this it's... was uh, this was that in fast forward. This is the golf cart that, uh, not the golf cart, the car that John Cena drove in Mania in Detroit against Shawn Michaels. I think he was actually going as fast as L.A. Knight did when he flew in on that other car. Now, he had drove a fast car tonight, too, yeah. yeah he yeah, went a little yeah. too fast. So they're having a very good match. I'm very much enjoying all this. And the three-way dynamic, made, you know, it's, it's a three-way match. They're making the most out of that. So it's not just, it's not random guys hitting each other. There, there's switches and turns and alliances and betrayals and all this. And then Orton hits the RKO. And he is yanked out, or the ref gets uh, yanked out of the ring by a water bottle. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, oh, so it's Logan. Logan. He is, Orton's going to punt Logan Paul. Logan gets yanked out of the ring by the water bottle. You all know this is going to happen. This match was not ending of course. before this bottle did something. The water bottle then unmasks as, I am pretty sure, McAfee said, ice show no. speed. I show speed. Oh. Letter I. S H O W. Whatever. Okay. So this guy tries to fight Randy Orton. I, I can tell you're not going to do this justice. Have it. Okay. Yeah. I show speed, unmasks, and he gets in Randy's face, and he starts fucking, fucking, fucking Barking. swearing at him. Just one f bomb after another, and Randy's looking at this guy dressed as a fucking water bottle, and uh, and you know he's gonna he's gonna give him a boot, and Randy Orton, who is the lightest, smoothest. Dream of a worker you could ever be in the ring with. He sees this outfit <laughs> and he figures it's heavily padded. And so he rears back and he fucking kicked this guy so hard. He fucking kicked this guy. He went flying in this outfit. I was dying. And he starts ripping it all off and he's going to go kill this guy on the table. And uh, he gives him the RKO. And the table's supposed to break. It did not break. And Randy was not happy because that fucking sucked. And so uh, Logan posts Randy, throws him in the ring, misses a frog splash. Kevin suddenly hits him with a pop-up powerbomb, uh, hits a stunner on Orton. Orton kicks out. Kevin tries another pop-up powerbomb, but Orton hits the RKO out of nowhere. Logan throws Orton outside into the post, hits a frog splash on Kevin, pins him. I thought this was a very good match. Very good match. Finish was exactly what you would have thought. What did you think there, Eddie? I thought the crowd made this match awesome. They chanted Gatorade. Yeah, yeah they hated. Yeah, yeah. They hated yeah, crime. And then we want Logan, water. Mm -hmm. uh, Logan Paul, when he was punching Kevin Owens in the corner, says, drink prime mf -er, you're fat. <laughs> Uh, I don't, I for, you guys forgot that I show speed was actually barking at Randy, and Randy kind of like broke character and laughed. Uh, and I'll be he honest, I barking was, after the RKO. I was trying to talk as but, little about speed as I could. Oh come right. on, this yeah. is great. But uh, one thing that I, I even mentioned this in the chat, and probably every Logan Paul match, why does he use brass knucks when he has titanium in his fist? It's That's just a good question. Me. That's a good question. Uh, but uh. Logan because Paul because the heel amazing. has to be able to take it, and the heel can't take the titanium out of his fist. That would be mm -hmm. messy. Yep, but uh, Logan Paul is freaking amazing. I think at one point he did a freaking swanton bomb into a frog splash, and then that that arc, that pop up bar bomb into an RKO was pretty awesome. One of the probably not top RKO in Randy Orton's WrestleMania moment. I think it was him and Seth Rollins after the best one, but probably a top three to four. Pop up power bomb into RKO was pretty pretty dope. As you noted, but yeah, Michael, it was a great match. Michael Cole had a great night, and part of it's because with no one shouting in his ear anymore, he could just say what's actually he's actually thinking and feeling, and it makes him much more credible. But man, when he said, "Yeah, I've been here for twenty whatever years, and I've never seen a a rookie or a young wrestler take to this business as quickly as Logan Paul," he's right. Logan yeah. Paul was born for this. Yeah, he really was. Fantastic. And you know, the thing with, with Cole is the reason that Cole is so much better now is because he's so much more his actual self. Whereas before he was just a robot that said generic shit the entire time. Yes. The thing that's holding him back from actually being like an all-time great announcer is he was a robot for so long that he can't help but say the generic bullshit. Like even though he doesn't need to anymore. 
He still has to talk about the WWE universe. He still has to say this this shit that Vince made him say. And it's like, Vince is gone, dude. Let it go. You can say belt. You can say wrestler. You can say fan. Like, And the problem is he said it for so long that that is Michael Cole now. It, it's like it's like part of him. It's like, what Darth Vader say? I'm more machine now than man? That That's Cole. Like, he's more of the WWE machine now than a normal person. And if he could break some of those habits, like, and remain being a real person, he probably would end up going down as one of the great announcers of all time. But I'm not sure he's going to, uh, he's going to make it. Hard for old dogs to learn new tricks. They Sean say. Colt hard. Yes. He's much co closer to that now than, than he has been ever in his career. Yes. So up to this point, the show had certainly been fun. Thumbs up for everything. I don't know if it was terribly memorable. That was Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm sorry, everybody. Regardless, at this point, it was time for the two main events of the evening, starting with EO Sky versus Bailey. And they play this video package. That's the same one I think they played yesterday. And there's pyramids in the screen. And Bailey comes out in this Egyptian goddess outfit, outfit with men in dog masks carrying her on her their shoulders, laying her down, and then worshiping at her feet. And she has a smile on her face. And from this point... From the moment she came out to the end of her, her show, she was absolutely determined to remind y'all who the hell she is. And she came out. She was a star. She was happy to be there. She had the people on her side. And Eo came out, and they, in ring, bell to bell, had the best wrestling match of the night. I would say that that is I don't think true. I don't think it's close. I guess Cody and Roman had some cool wrestling in between all the smoke and mirrors. But this was two athletes having a match. There was no interference. There was no bullshit. There was no fuck finish. No distractions. Just a great wrestling match. And not only that, you know, Tom's a big fan of Bailey, Filthy Tom. And uh, he texted me and he was like, I can't believe the fans love Bailey so much. And I was like, why? Where you been? Yeah, the like, last decade. She is so popular. And, you know, the fans, they were singing the Bailey song the entire match. To the point where I was like, you guys are so busy singing the song that you're not fucking paying attention to the match. She's like making comebacks and they're not popping for her spots because they're busy singing her damn song. And there's Bailey chants, Let's Go Bailey, constant singing. I mean, this had great heat. Crowd loved this match. So the first, I don't know, six, seven minutes is almost entirely fought on the floor. There's a dive on the floor. Uh, Eo tries to dive off the barricade, gets suplexed on the floor. Top rope moonsault to the floor. Finally, they get back in the ring. Bailey does a sunset flip into the turnbuckle, which looks looks terribly painful. They're just suplexing the hell out of each other. Eo's suplexes were doing horrible, terrible things to Bailey's neck, and I hope she's okay in the long run. But that looks God. They had cool. one German where Bailey, uh, she was just like her neck, like her chin was on her navel. Yeah. And she was just upside down for moments on end. So she, uh, EO tries a moonsault, but Bailey gets the bad knee up. And uh, Bailey's knee had been worked on, had been slammed into the post, and there was a hanging knee bar off the apron. So she was limping the entire match. And, and uh, it was at this point when Bailey gets the bad knee up on the moonsault. This was the point where the crowd stopped singing and actually reacting to the match itself and what was going on and chanting Bailey's name. She missed an elbow. Eo gets a cross face, gets that several times, transitions to an STF. Bailey escapes, gets a belly to Bailey for two, but Eo takes over and gets a moonsault. And that gets two, but she keeps on moonsaulting her. Until Bailey dodges one, hits something called a rose plant. Oh, a rose plant. Strange move. I've not seen we before. We got to get rid of that move. And the, it looks terrible. Belly to Bailey is a perfectly fine finisher. Yes. But uh, Eo no sells the rose plant, but then gets clotheslined off her, off her feet. No, is that what happened? She countered it. I see. With a head spring. Ah. Which was an incredible counter, and she went for something off the ropes, and Bailey hit a lariat. And as soon as she hit that lariat, yep, yep. this place was on their feet. They were going fucking seventy thousand people jumping up and down at once. She went up top, back suplex, elbow off the top. And then went back to that stupid rose plant. Yeah. And, uh, like, I think the crowd thought that EO was going to kick out of the rose plant because it looks it looks so not impressive. It's like when, uh, before they had the Birmingham, remember they did, like, that combo tiger driver, uh, Tyler Bate and Pete Dunn? 
And it was like such a lame looking, nothing happened in finish that after two weeks, they got a new finish. And this rose plant, like she did it and like they were so into her and they so wanted her to win, but it looked so lame compared to like the flying elbow that they were surprised when she won. And then they were delighted and overjoyed that she won. That was great. Best match, best in ring match of the night. Eddie, what'd you think? I thought this was a good match. Uh, Bailey definitely deserved it. If you obviously going back to 2021, she was the one that created damage control, brought EO Sky, Dakota Kai back, brought the creative to Triple H. So you could see the excitement, uh, her emotions at the beginning of the match, even in the end. Uh, part of me was thinking like the motion and the heat of this match should have been in the Usos match. You had two brothers, and that match sucked. It was the horrible. Match, the, yeah. So. Uh, Bailey deserved it. Uh, I think right now she's probably competing with Mercedes Monet with the new finishers. Which one is more horrible? They should stick to that. Is their actually previous. true. That is actually so true. So I feel like I feel like they should go back to the be belly to belly and then uh, the her bank statement. Like they they gotta get rid of their new finishers. But this match was awesome. Emotion, heat, uh, surprising because you know usually the match before the main event is usually like dead because they're waiting for the main event but well no, it was pretty much into it that you're right that's how it used to be but this feels like a new era well it's the best new... match on both nights was the semi-main that's right they the, they no longer have a buffer match yeah and uh which is great because you know that was one of those things that wwe did where you know a lot of people thought well you have to have a buffer match before the main event and the fact is, and we've learned it, if you watch a New Japan show, if you watch an AEW pay-per-view, you don't, if you watch a UFC show, if you watch literally anything except WWE that has things in a sequence, you don't need a buffer match. And the other thing that helped, particularly in this case, is the show was shorter. We were only like two and a half hours in when this match started. And so the fans didn't have time to get tired. So they were super into it. It was a great match. Uh, you know, in-ring, here's what I'm going to say about this, okay? In-ring, bell-to-bell. It's four-star match. That was four stars. Now, the main event. Remember that Rock Hulk Hogan match, 2002? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think Dave gave that match a star and a half. Okay. People have been bitching about this for 22 years now. Yeah. Because they talk about the crowd reaction, and they talk about all that stuff, and they say it should have been for whatever. All of this is stupid, but I'm just, I'm going to make a point here. So, like, if that's going to be your argument, that that match should have been, like, four stars because, you know, the crowd was going nuts and the heat and, and just felt legendary, Cody and Roman Reigns was a five-star match. I mean, for what it was, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And I just... This is a this is a more than year long story. It started when Cody showed up in WWE, and then he had that feud with Seth, and then he tore his pec off the bone, and he still wrestled Hell in a Cell with a torn pec, beat Cody a second time, had to take all that time off, and then he uh, it was built up to uh, WrestleMania last year, and unless someone writes a book someday and tells me I'm wrong. And I've said this several times, and no one has ever told me I'm wrong. Cody was going to win last year, and Vince showed up that weekend and changed the fucking plans. And uh, and once he did, you know, it was like, what the fuck? I remember people leaving. I remember, you know, it was just like, what in the fuck are they even thinking? And as it turns out, they actually made it work. They actually made the following year work. And in the end, it actually wasn't a disaster because Cody ended up becoming the number one guy in the company because Roman wasn't there most of the time. And Cody was a top babyface, And he did huge business for pay-per-views and for house shows and merch. I mean, he was basically the champion all year. He just didn't have the belt. And they built up to this one here. And, you know, it was the same thing. You know, Rock showed up. It wasn't Vince. It was Rock this time. And uh, Rock decided to my match with, with Roman. We're doing it this year. And, you know, they're going to have that show on Wednesday. It's funny. They're having uh, Behind the Curtain on Wednesday in both AEW and WWE. That's true. But anyway, you know, Rock showed up and he wanted the, the Roman match. And so they did the angle where Cody stepped aside. And they had a whole storyline to explain all of this. 
But the fans were so furious that they went back on it and they put Cody back in the main event and Rock turned heel and they brought the Cody thing and the Seth thing back into it. And, you know, when all was said and done, I mean, this was like the biggest thing they ever did. And for this as a payoff match, Cody finishing the story, ending Roman Reigns' multi-year reign, I mean, you couldn't have had a more perfect match. And they did a video package beforehand, and I was downstairs eating because I figured this was going to be like an hour before the match, and they actually were starting before I was done eating. But I'm watching it on my phone, just kind of half paying attention. And they start doing this Cody video package, and they're telling his story, and they mention offhandedly that Cody left and started a revolution. And all of a sudden, the fucking young bucks Matthew and Nicholas. are on my screen. Yeah. I went, what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Kenny Omega? And that's when I was like, this, this is a new WWE. I mean, they have a story here. And Dustin was there. He was in a skybox with uh, Ricky Starks. Ricky Starks. And I think uh, QT was there. And uh, Minus One obviously was there. And, you know, they had a lot of people there. And, you know, they were loud in and everything like that. And uh, so they did this video package here. And I was like, wow, how about that? They acknowledged him leaving and starting AEW. They didn't say the words AEW, but they told, they told that part of the story. That's part of the canon of WWE. Yeah. Cody left and started another promotion with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. And then he returned... And, uh, and here we are. And Brandy came out with him, who, by the way, you know, whatever you want to say about Brandy, she came out and got a huge pop. Yep. They went crazy for her. And then, uh, you know, we were off to the races. Thought Roman's entrance with the, uh, the school band yep. was fucking amazing. And they did the ring intros. And this was not one of those main events where nobody cares. I mean, this place was buzzing. Yep. They were like, we've waited a long fucking time. And tonight's the night. And Cody and Roman, fucking amazing shape. I'm not talking like cosmetic shape, like, you know, you went to the gym or whatever. They look like athletes. Roman was just his athletic prime. Cody looked great. Hard trained pro athletes they looked like. Yeah. And then the match started, and it was everything you would have expected, and the fans ate it up. It was great. Yes. So the match finally begins. They do a few hardcore things, and Cody grabs a table, but Roman cuts him off and pushes the table back, and everyone boos. And for about oh, five minutes, maybe a little more, it was a Roman Reigns title defense. Hit a move, stand there, badmouth him. I'll send you to Hollywood the rest of them. This is my company, you little bitch. At which point McAfee responds, still out of his mind, our tribal chief talking that shit. <laughs> What was that moment where Michael Cole wouldn't say a bad word and then and then uh... it was I think it was when Damian Priest came out. But yes, it was it was uh, Damian Priest cashing in. That's right. Da- Priest is celebrating. Punk is sitting and cackling and clapping, and Cole says, "Holy sh!" And he stops and there's a long long pause, yeah. and then McAfee just goes, "Shit, shit!" <laughs> right into the mic. I howled. <laughs> what is this guy doing? He's, he's well. He's hanging out with. Steve. I think we all know. Yeah. So. Uh, the other great moment was when they're going back and forth. Roman, oh, he also, he, he, he <laughs> accused, Ro- first, first, first he lays Cody out and says something about a multi-million dollar bonus and laughs. That made me laugh. Then he hits, he hits Cody with a crossroads, makes a cover, Cody kicks out, Roman is dejected, he turns to Paul Heyman and says, that move sucks! <laughs> that move don't be nobody! I will hear no... Negativity towards Roman Reigns. He is fucking great. And he was awesome in this match. So they do some back and forth, and there's a nut shot and a Superman punch, and uh, Cody hits the crossroads. <laughs> He's going to go for another one, but Jimmy Uso arrives to super kick him in the face. And at that moment, that's when it felt like the match has actually begun. Because the whole point of this was there's going to be lots of interference. So. Yeah, but you know what was great? I think all the fans also knew that. But that did not stop them from getting into the first part of the match. Like in the old days, they would do something where you knew somebody was going to run in and the people would just be dead quiet because they knew nothing was going to happen until the guy ran in. But they were like totally into this match, even though they knew 80 million people were about to run in. 
So we have uh, Jimmy's out there. Jay runs out to fight with Jimmy. Thank God they had a better night than they did the night before. Uh, Jay tackles Jimmy off the stage, maybe through a table. We're not quite sure. Well, there were two tables there. I think they only went through one. But the, the, the point is, they fell a long way. And I hope they're okay. It was not just, you know, you fall three feet off the stage through two tables. I mean, they fell and fell and fell and then crashed through these tables. I was like, holy shit, that was scary. So next is Solo Sokoa. He runs out there. He spikes Cody. Cody still kicks out. Same finish from last year. That was the finish. Mm -hmm. Solo thumbed Cody as he was going for the crossroads, and then Roman speared him and pinned him. This time, Roman speared him and didn't pin him. Cody kicked out. So Solo... Can't believe somebody kicked out of his spike. Screams at Roman, finish him! And Roman screams back, I know! <laughs> they hit a spear and spike combo. That also gets to, before they have a chance to do anything else, out runs John Cena. You know what? This was great because they hit the music. I'm not sure people thought that John Cena would be there. I think probably many people figured that he would, but they hit his music and they went fucking nuts. And this guy ran to the ring, and uh, God bless John Cena... Still looks great, but that guy ain't a runner. And he was <laughs> suffering running down that long-ass uh, uh, ramp. At his peak, agility was never a strong suit. No, no. and he flies into the ring, and he beats up Solo, and uh, he gave him an AA through a table. And this was great because, you know, they did that John Cena solo match. And remember, Solo just destroyed him, I, absolutely I, destroyed him, yeah. to the point where you thought this may be the end of Rock's career, or uh, John Cena's career. And, you know, John Cena had hinted that he was going to be back, and people were like, you know, man, that was a one-sided, you know, what's John Cena? Well, here's the answer. John Cena showed up and got his revenge on Solo in the main event of WrestleMania, and the place loved it. So, yeah, I, I had forgotten that whole Cena-Solo thing. Michael Cole, who had a great night, reminded us of that. So Cena's satisfied. He has gotten his vengeance here on the Solo Sokoa fella when The Rock's music hits. And suddenly, Cena is both surprised and very, very disappointed. <laughs> you know what's great about The Rock is, like, we were talking about Chris Jericho and how he, he always has some way to reinvent his character or whatever. Yeah. This final boss, who does nothing but fucking swear, is, like, Rock is coming down this ramp, and, like, the camera's just watching him, him walk down the ramp, and he's like, God damn motherfucker, what's this fucking mother? And he's just, like, the whole way down, and they're trying to bleep everything. And, like, the whole time, he's just swearing his head off this whole time. This this crazed madman final boss rock. Love this character. He storms out. He is bleeped more than a, two months' worth of NXT crowds. And they have a stare down. It's Black Adam versus Peacemaker. And the fight goes exactly like a Black Adam Peacemaker fight would go. Rock destroys him. Yeah, Cena tries one swing, and yeah. Rock just grabs him and gives him the rock bottom. Cena ever knows how unselfish Cena is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is not my fight. It's okay. Even though I just killed a guy, this guy can kill me. Then the shield music hits. Yes. And I thought, oh, my God. Did they get did they, did they get lone Dean Ambrose back for one night? You could have asked me. Well, I think they actually had people believing it was possible. Sure. But, brother, you ain't getting John Moxley. No. If they're not going to even let Dustin sit in the front row th row with uh, with Cody's family. Yes. It is family. So it is, of course, Seth Rollins. This poor dork. Who had a terrible, <laughs> terrible weekend. Now let's review. He makes the trip to SmackDown, where his championship defense is not mentioned even one time. He main events night one, where he and his partner get their asses beat. And are screwed. He opens night two, where he gets his ass beat and loses the title. He returns for the main event of night two with a weapon. He yeah. was armed. Yes. And he gets in this ring to attack the rock. But Roman sees him coming, spears him to death. Seth Rollins. It was a Superman punch. Uh, regardless. Yes. Seth Rollins, I'm afraid, you're geek of the week. Do you remember when uh, he came out at the beginning of the show and CM Punk said, look at this goof? Yes. You know, <laughs> I mean, I like him as a guy. I like him as a wrestler. He has the worst character in this business. Actually, he doesn't. Uh, that'd be uh, Tatum Paxley <laughs> and uh, Joe Gacy. So he's third, okay. But man, I felt bad for the guy here. <laughs> I was like... You were a fucking geek here. 
He just got laid out. He's doing this the shield gimmick. He's doing the callback. And he just gets fucking laid out. So Rock gets his strap. And he's about to strap the hell out of this nerd in a flak jacket. And the dong hit. I wish I was there when Granny heard the dong hit. Oh, my Lord. It's The Undertaker. The lights go out. They come back. Taker's in the ring. Rock is scurred. Taker hits a big-ass choke slam. Lights go out. Taker vanishes. So now... Actually, everybody vanished. That's true. Everybody disappeared with the exception of Roman Cody, Reigns, Roman, and Seth. Yeah, Seth Rollins is still in the ring. And Roman grabs that chair, and he's eyeballing Cody. But he turns. Because this guy has been carrying a grudge for a decade of when Seth Rollins broke up the shield by hitting him in the back with a chair. And he finally gets his payback after beating his ass dozens of times in between. He lays out Seth with his chair. But you know what, Vinny? Mm -hmm. I know people hate the term cinema, and I won't use it. But if you were going to use cinema for anything, mm -hmm. Roman Reigns had this multi-year reign. And when those lights came back on, there was a weight belt in the ring, and there was a chair in the ring, and Cody Rhodes was down. All he had to do was get that chair and beat the shit out of Cody, and he would have won. Yep. But instead, he picked up that chair... And he saw that silly goof. Mm -hmm. And he saw that flak jacket. And he remembered when this idiot turned on him 10 fucking years ago. And he could not help himself yeah. but give this nerd a beating. Long-term storytelling. And that led directly <clears throat> yes. to him getting booted in the face, three crossroads, and pinned. It was his own fucking fault. Hoisted by his own petard. Exactly. But it wasn't like Seth, you know, helped Cody win. Seth was That's merely, for sure. He was just a body. Seth was, in fact, He useless. did not help Cody one bit. Yes. And, uh, you know, Roman tried the spear, got booted. Cody had three of his crossroads yes. and pinned him. It was operatic in scope. Yes. And Cody gets this win. And we have not mentioned Samantha Irvin tonight. <laughs> she She had a great night, too. But you can hear it in her voice, and uh, your own website, Brian, has retweeted the video. She is choking back tears. Yes. As she makes the announcement, her voice warbling. Warbling, I say. As she announces, here is your winner and the new Universal Champion, the American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes. And Cody is crying, and Brandy is crying, and Michael Cole is giving a speech about how he knew Cody since he was a little boy, always knew he had star power. He left here sad and heartbroken to create his own story, came back a superstar, did something his father, one of the greatest of all time, could ever... He's crying as he's telling the story. Punk gets in the ring to uh, raise his hand. He's not crying. And uh, then Cody did as he promised, and he handed the title to his mother because he could not hand it to his father. And so then Cody starts cutting this promo, and he says, I know it's been a long night, long weekend. I just want to say one thing. There are two people. I would not be here right now if it were not the, for these two people. I want them to come out right now. One of them, he said, is Bruce Pritchard. And you could just hear the crowd. The crowd was like, we like you, Cody. <laughs> we don't want to turn on you. <laughs> but we are not cheering for Bruce Pritchard. It was like silence when he called out Bruce Pritchard. And then he said, the other guy is somebody who is kicking and screaming and fighting to avoid doing this, but it is a new era, and I demand Triple H come down to the ring. And, uh, you know, out comes uh, Bruce and he hugs Cody, and there's no reaction whatsoever. They do not want to cheer him. And then uh, out comes Triple H, and they do cheer him. And he comes down the ramp looking like he's pissed. Like, God damn it, we went over this, motherfucker. I don't want to come out. But, man, he got in the ring, and he's trying so hard not to cry. He's beat red. He hugs Cody and, like, fought, just fighting to hold back tears. And then Randy and Sammy put Cody on their shoulders. Cody hugs Cole. He shakes hands with McAfee and Corey. He's hugging cameramen. He's he's hugging, like, these blokes that put the lights up and down. I mean, and then he runs into uh, Nick Khan. And there's someone next to Nick Khan. I don't know who it is. But, like, Nick puts out his hand to shake Cody. Cody goes to the person next to him. Poor Nick has to stand there all weird. 
And then he shakes Nick's hand, and then, I mean, this is great. Absolutely great. They made this look like the coronation of the next Hulk Hogan. I'm trying to remember. Bruno. I'm trying to remember the last time in WWE the locker room emptied, emptied to celebrate a new champion. It may have been Hulk Hogan with Andre pouring champagne on him. I feel like it's been done at some point. It, Angle, maybe, or something. Angle was one. Yeah. Oh, the, I think it was his family. Yeah. I don't know if the, the locker room emptied like that. Which, which, by the way, a classic Dusty Rhodes trope. Yeah. So, as as much as I love the match, the match is a million zillion stars. Uh, the post match was even better, and and like an even bigger sign that things have changed here because we don't, you haven't seen. Well, I haven't seen a babyface win at Mania in forever, but uh, when they do, they're usually out there alone. And here's the locker room as a united front, happy and proud of this guy for what he's done. His family is out there, a bunch of people you don't know, random children, negative one. And Cody does his bit and is the, the, the most baby facest baby face ever saw, hugging like, every employee of the thousands that work for this company. And uh, everyone loved him and he loved everyone. And that was a win. And the show ended and you've never been happier at the end of a WWE show. Yeah. I will never forget that uh, WrestleMania when Shawn Michaels retired. And, you know, that wasn't something where they were out to screw you. It was just like he was done and he wanted to do the match. And, you know, he was obviously going to lose and everything like that. But I remember that show ended and I just remember sitting there and like the crowd was just silent. And we all just stood up and we quietly left. <laughs> and like there's tens of thousands of people walking through the halls of I forget what building it was, all heading to their cars or whatever. And they're just quiet and they're just sad. And like, you know, to them, that was the end of an era. You know, Shawn Michaels, for a lot of them, that was like the greatest wrestler who ever lived. And they sat there and they watched him retire and they knew they were never going to see him wrestle again until a horrible match in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and, uh, and this was the opposite. It was like, I think for a lot of fans and, you know, say what you will about, about WWE and, you know, there's probably still people that need to go. But there's also a lot of really good people there, and they do want this to be a new era. And fans obviously want this to be a new era. No fan is sitting there going, I long for the old days when we had a bunch of assholes in charge and motherfuckers. <laughs> no, everybody wants it to be a new era. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what this show was about, trying to tell you that, you know, that's what we're really trying to do here is we are trying to make this a new era and put the past behind us. So hopefully they can. That's all we can hope for is that they can.